<clears throat> it's a great honor to be here. I tell you something quickly. Something happens to you when you climb this red stage. You deal with three kinds of egos. You deal with your ego. You deal with the ego of the speakers that were before you. And unfortunately, you have to deal with the ego of everyone listening. So I'll make it easy. What we'll do is just put all those egos by the side and uh, get to communicating. Here's the second thing everybody said, and I like it, um, uh, the way my predecessors said it. You, you are locked in between, this is an international presentation. Are you going to use slides? Are you going to try to memorize everything? Are you going to bring it out? Are you going to communicate with the people one-on-one? -on -one? Are we going to be lost in the interaction? Will I give them my story? This, believe me, nobody's going to tell you the truth. This is what you spend half the time preparing with. So you know what? We throw that out too. We're not going to bother. We're just going to talk. Are we good? <laughs> because I discovered how we just talk. It makes sense. Here's the last one. These dilemmas happen while you are preparing your notes. The last one is, which audience are you really talking to? Are you talking to Potakot? Because this is Ted Stadium, Potakot. But are you talking to the whole world? Which message will you give? The one for them or the one for them? Like, you know, like, <laughs> there's, two, there's two of them. And I hope that at the end of our you know, interaction today, the message will be able to serve both grounds. I want to talk to you today about um, culture. You know, and basically that's, uh, that's what resonated in my heart when I was given the opportunity to stand on this great platform. I think the great thing about TED is that you not only get the opportunity to show the problem, you also get a chance to offer the solution. And it's a, it's a great thing to be able to stand with these great minds and, and do what we do. Okay, so what is culture? And I wrote the definition down. I'll read off this page. Now listen to I will read off this page. Because you watch everybody, people are smart. He said, Malcolm Gladwell just came before I came on. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> All right, so culture in anthropology is the patterns of behavior and thinking that people living in social groups learn, create, and share. And I'll read that definition again. Culture in anthropology, the patterns of behavior and thinking that people live, living in social groups learn, create, and share. I want you to hold on to that definition, and especially the last three parts. Learn, create, and share. If I was to ask you, how do you see? Biologically, you would tell me, you see with what? Your eyes. I mean, uh, uh, Abby? Because some people see through their amulets. I know this is Africa. We've gone past that. <laughs> the inner eye. <laughs> you know, but basically, um, when you say, how do you see? People see through their eyes. But in, in anthropology, or basically, uh, when we're looking at this cultural con uh, concept or this context, people do not see through their eyes. They see through their eyes, of course, in biology. But in truth, people see through their cultures. And it's true. It's uh, a big name. But it's called encapsulation. We are all in our world, in that world where we have defined what our norms are, uh, we have defined what it is right to learn, what it is right to avoid, what we should hold up and what we should esteem, what we regard as rubbish, what we call treasure. Do you understand this? If we stay in this world, uh, everybody outside this world is not normal. Do I make sense? Yes, I do. Because the truth of the matter is, though we see with our eyes, <laughs> we actually see through our cultures. And that's the important reason why I'm talking about culture today. Let me give you another definition. And uh, culture creates the filters with which we see our world. And every culture is a chance to see our world through new eyes. Now, these definitions may fall flat if I don't give you an example, something for you to see and how powerful just a contrast of cultures can make the difference between what you call opportunities presently and challenges on the other side. Um, in Siberia, uh, there's a tribe in Siberia called Tuvan, and what this tribe 
uh, has a very interesting way of naming things. You know, the culture of a place has the language and, and so many other things. It's got the technology, it's got the language, it's got the dressing, it's got the how to cook. All of these things are embedded in culture. So I, I don't want to break this further down, but you agree with me, you know what a goosey soup means. But you also agree with me, as I've mentioned, that all those standing out there watching Ted from the other part of the world are lost. Right? Good. So, um, when this concept of Tuvan, Tuvan has uh, an interesting naming system. They have a language. They say things like this. They do not say, uh, in English you say, snake. But in Tuvan you say, ground fish. Uh, when you translate snake in Duvan, it says ground fish. Their naming system or the way they think is expressed in their culture through their language. Uh, oh, you read me. So when, when it's like that, they said, oh, that's ground fish. That's ground fish. Again, another way to look at snake. Now, uh, <clears throat> and, uh, snake, you know how to leave the building. Oh, uh, ground fish, you still be here. Your ground fish will bite somebody. So... <laughs> So you see how, how it works. But perhaps something more interesting is what they do with, um, with how they do their aging system. For example, we say I'm 15, and next year I'll be 16, and next year I'll be 17. This is how the English taught us to think. Oh, did I just say that? I got ahead of my lecture. This is how the English taught us to think, because basically we are you know, a colony of that empire, or what used to be that empire, and then we received of that culture, and so we have to think in 15s, in 16s, in 17s, and in 18s. Now, but the Duvan, they, they think differently. This is what they do. They say, I'm 15 in. Now, they have to make up for what happens between 14 and 15. Yes, so they don't say, I'm 14, uh, if they are 14 and one day old. So they say, what, how old are you? If yesterday I was 14, today I'm 15 in. And until we get to 15, we are 15 in. Then when we land 15, we are 15. And then one day afterwards, we are 16 in. Now, this line of thinking makes or breaks. You can see how two different ways of seeing can be born just by two different cultures, you know, coming, coming, just side by side as you compare these cultures. Well, let me make you see it this way. This something as simple, yet as powerful as this, can show you the difference between how somebody starts their business. In our model, it's very simple. You get everything together before you begin. You get the registration done, you get the business plan done, you get the this, that, that, because you must 14, right? <laughs> huh? And you ever wonder what happens to our brothers, you know, this is localized, you can't help it, I'm in Nigeria. You ever wonder what our brothers do? They don't write business plan. They don't do any of those things. They don't calculate plenty things. They just start shop and they're 15 in. Huh? <laughs> well, one of the greatest things about culture is that culture creates difference. And I think this is something you can take home with you, is the fact that the reason for culture is difference. You know, why is everybody in the world not the same? Why do we have different thumbprints? Why do we have different fingerprints? Why our iris is different? Why are we different? What's the idea? Why are people in nations? What is the objective? Uh, the objective of all this is to create difference. But the real question will be, what is the advantage of difference? If it does have any, why so different? Why should we even have difference? Listen to this. You can learn many things by just studying nature, looking at biology, studying the way the world was created. And I'll give you an example with aphids. And at the danger of sounding too scientific, uh, which, by the way, I wasn't very good at, but at danger of sounding too scientific, I won't tell you the story of aphids and um, humans. Now, the aphid is a bug-like creature, stays on trees, uh, and uh, is always preyed on by every, they are at the bottom of the food chain. Everything eats them. So um, for them, uh, part of their adaptation device, the way they live, the way they, they, they survive, is that they can't afford to give birth. Do you understand? Birth is complicated. They clone. The, the aphid gives birth, you know, the aphid clones itself out, and it does 10,000 one time. Do you understand? Every, 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 it's a copy. Everyone is the same parents. 
And one parent is both male and female, if you understand how this works. Bi biologists will help me with the rest. And they just bring them out because the truth of the matter, maybe 10,000, 9,000 might be dead by tomorrow so that there will be one living. So here's the problem with, uh, with mass production like that. The thing about cloning is that when you clone, you bring out a replica from the exact replica, the same DNA sample, the same structure from the parents. There are no changes. There is no difference. The problem with that is whatever that parent has not discovered or has not become resilient from, like disease, has not uh, increased its, um, uh, just a word, and it seems to skip my head, yeah? Immunity, that's a good one. It's a, whatever they've not put their immunity from, they've not entered in, the children or the clones can't. So the disease that kills daddy kills all the children. See, that's the beauty of how life is designed and why we give birth, is that the birth or the child or the, of a mammal or human beings, it doesn't matter how you place it, we are not replicas of our parents. We are different. First, there has to be a combination. Then the code is altered. Then what comes is neither this nor that, and it's always stronger. The human race was designed not to be destroyed by a single disease. Somebody will have the strain, somebody will discover the resilience, it will pass on to the next one, and that is the very culture of difference. You know what is interesting is that difference is persecuted. Behind every single trial, war, every single act of um, um, uh, every pogrom, every crime committed by the human race, one to the other, is difference. You, you could call it a world war, but it's national difference, interest difference. You could call it whatever it is, it's difference. You know, people consider what is their kind um, by what looks like me. And that's just what works, what looks like me. And so when culture goes wrong, what you have is a culture that doesn't stand with or does not respect difference. But culture originally was designed to produce difference. And if I sell this to you, it makes a world of difference. Let's take a look at it this way. Once you begin to celebrate difference, that's, that whole nucleus or that whole line of thinking or that way of seeing your world begins to open up new opportunities. The aim of culture is to produce difference. Let me say something to you um, about tolerance. I'll do this quickly. All over the world, as the world begins to close up and form a global community, the cry of the nations and everybody saying it's tolerance. I need to tolerate you, you need to tolerate me. And I say something on this platform and it will resonate and I hope it gets into the hearts of people to see. The message of tolerance is not tolerance. The message of tolerance is difference, should be difference. What we should embrace is difference. What we should even inculcate is difference. And if you listen to the speakers one after the other, and standing here and describing their stories, some in testimonies, some in stories, some in slides, all that it was about was embracing difference. Embracing difference. Finally, coming to terms with the fact that we are stronger when we hold on to diversity. We are stronger when we do something else. It makes perfect sense to not be like daddy. It makes perfect sense to be completely out from that box. And this will, I believe, not only in our country and our context, affect us to a great dimensions. Let me say something about this um, and about this global community I talked about, about the convergence happening in the world today. You've heard it said, and it's true, it said that the world is a global village and everything is coming together and everything is converging. The great thing about that, you've got increase in trade, you've got increase in, um, in economies, you've got increase in, in um, cooperation, collaborations, and you can see that uh, things are a lot easier now, knowledge is a lot easier now, sharing is a lot easier now, and we have this great big global culture. The problem with that, though, is that that stands with a risk, or that cost comes with a great price. The great price is whose culture exactly are we running? Now, if we look at cultures as windows, as I described, or ways of thinking, you now see that what we might be experiencing is the poem, 10 green bottles standing on the wall. If one green bottle accidentally falls down, no replacement in it. Each of the windows that disappear are ways to approach the subject. Each of the windows that disappear are ways to face the problem. Each of the windows that disappear are ultimately other ways to solve it. And if these windows continue to fall down, what you have is one great global community, one great global village, with whose culture really? 
you know, <laughs> let me say this this way. What colonization really did, uh, what, what you have, you have Hannibal when he, he, he came and uh, he did his campaigns in, in Egypt, you have Alexander the Great and his campaigns in India, in Persia, and you have, um, uh, you have the British when they came in to Africa, uh, the European states, whatever. What did colonization really do? What did it take away? It took away politics, it took away this, it took away that, it made us, yeah, there's so many things we already know. You can check the history textbooks. But greater than all of this was that it took away in every one of the places where there was colonization, it took away the way the people think. And bottom line of what we are trying to replace hundreds of years later is how to think our way. Because you, it seems you have to cross two mountains to do something right. You have to first overcome the mountain of thinking like someone. Then after thinking like someone, you have to stop thinking like the person. It's written in the book, think differently. To think differently, you have to first understand English, right? <laughs> then right after understanding English, you now go, okay, no, now we must now stop thinking like the English. So uh, this poses these windows falling down or these windows closing poses to be one of the greatest challenges of our regions. Regions here, regions in Africa, most of those that are, uh, our friend here talk, talked about in the Mint, this is our real struggle. Our real struggle is not what happened to us 100 years ago in the sense that the white man left and so we're there, uh, and I say that carefully. But the real struggle is that when knowledge is not being appreciated or understood through your eyes, when you're not seeing it through your vision, when it's not coming through the way you think, then you're not contributing to it. You're only taking the ride. And there's no champion that comes out of you just taking the ride. Let me say these words in, in, in closure. What did Japan do differently? Um, well, Japan basically understood that it was time to change. Borders opened. It realized that the West had gone forward and it had to learn. It had to be different. But Japan was careful. What they wanted was the institutions of the West, but they didn't want it with the culture of the West. I think Nigeria can learn from that. The greatest problem we have is we have both the institutions from the West, and then we also have the culture of the West. Do you understand how confusing that can be? Walk into a bank, ever wonder why they are all sour? I mean, not just all sour, but you know what I mean. When you, wait, 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 what are you telling me? Somebody has been wearing a suit. So, and you know the heat out there. These things can cost you something. They are tense, they are tied up, they are there. And he's gone for marketing, you know. He's, he's back. He's sweating. His boss is still going to query him. Then he sits down. And you're now telling him, that's my voucher and expect a, a, a exceptional service. You hear a thing or two from that sweated individual. I, I need to tell you, what, what do you need to know that we are in the tropics? That you should wear something light. That corporate culture does not mean Western culture. That finally, think banking through the eyes of our area. But the banks I take on because of the many things they've done to me, that affects everybody and that affects every other industry, you know, at large. So this is what I would like to say. Our companies can do businesses culturally. We can do things differently. We should evolve from nine to four, eight to four, all those things that we grew up thinking this is how business is like, because business is not like anything. Business is not like the West, business is not like the East. Business is how we define it to be. And if we decide that this is how business is like, and this is what makes business work here, it makes all the difference. That's the idea of culture. We've heard business, we've read business. Now we understand business, but we want to interpret it, not through Western eyes. We want to interpret that business through our eyes. So maybe you should stop worrying about whether you have an office or whether you have the place or whether you have, because you built all of those things from watching all those movies you watch with that big fat guy sitting down on the throne room, turning with one axle chair. I mean, you said everybody has a chair that turns. Do you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> have a bench and get your work doing, and let's get on with this thing. <laughs> I challenge the entire world that the wheel needs to be reinvented, that we need to look at it one more time. And you know, the local wisdom is that don't reinvent the wheel. I say, let's do it. Bring that wheel again. My window was closed when you made it. And if I look at that wheel, if we look at that wheel together, we might put something dotted, something spotted, something on it that makes the wheel complete. Things are not complete until cultures look at it, until different ways of seeing are applied, even to same things. This is the bedrock of innovation. 
What happens to cars when Nigerians think about designing them? What happens to clothes when Nigerians are in it? What happens to media, to film? What happens to entertainment? What happens to whatever when we come on board and realize that the way we see is valid, the way we think is correct? Let me say this in closing. The new expedition, uh, the new expeditions of the world will be different. The next kind of things we will do, the new kind of journeys we will, be, we will take will be completely different from what has been done before. Listen to this. Alexander conquered Persia and India. The travels of Marco Polo revealed China. Christopher Columbus discovered the Americas. The scramble for Africa was done by the European states. It's time we make our ex ex expeditions. These expeditions will be cultural expeditions. We will open other windows and find new ways to think. But most of all, we will open our windows. Because essentially, our culture is not only who we are. It is in every way.